Greetings, fellow horror fans. Welcome to Killer POV. I am Becca from Fangoria, and I am joined by my handsome and charming co-host, Mr. Uh, Rob G. from Veernet. Hey, now. And Elric Kane from Inside Horror. That's me. Hey, guys. She thinks we're handsome and charming. I, I think do. She's looking at That's you. crazy. Well, I could call you lovely, but I thought I like handsome and charming lovely and amazing. was better. Lovely and amazing? Lovely and amazing. High fives. 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 No one made <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll get that joke later into the show. Um, so tonight we have a very special guest with us. Mr. Jeff Gross from Birdemic 2 is going to be joining us in a little bit. A very brave guest, I would say. I would say this man definitely has some cojones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll once. get to why in a second. Yeah. <laughs> and tonight we're going to be discussing our best worst movies. So we're looking for the movies that are just so bad that you have to love them. Or we will be talking about whether that even exists. And whether so bad it's good is a concept that can ever can actually be. Yes, I, I will defend that I don't believe in so bad it's good. Actually, I, I would have to, I don't know if I would agree with Rob, but I'd have to support that there's a lot of people that don't agree with this because right. like we've had seriously like heated arguments in Fango, you know, boardroom discussions because, you know, do we cover these ones that are so bad that they're good and things and like that. And what does that mean? And, and one person's trash and others treasure, all these kind of, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully get to all of that. Yeah. So we were going to kick off with what we watched this week. So guys, what did you watch this week? Oh boy. Um, I, uh, I honestly didn't have much time. I did actually watch one thing, but I, I was at Monster Mania this weekend. Oh, how was so, that? Yeah, I was going to talk about that rather than movies. Since Let's I do it. Monster well, Mania is an awesome convention and I haven't been in like two years. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was an experience. I'll put it that way. It's a lot more fun to go as a fan as opposed <laughs> to working the event. Um, yeah, I was at a table with um, Gavin Hignite, who works with me at Fearnet, and we were there repping Fearnet for the weekend, the first time that Fearnet's ever had a presence there. And um, it was by far the biggest crowd they've ever drawn, ever. And I haven't been there in like five years. It's a great show. It's it's in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, just outside Philadelphia. They usually do like 8,000 people, right? Yeah, and it's it was definitely more than that. Um, That's awesome. Now, I couldn't, I mean, I remember it being kind of crazy five years ago, so I don't know if it was just gradually getting bigger and bigger, but I had asked people there, and they're like, no, it kind of calmed down. This has been the biggest event, and I think... I think it has. I think it's because there were a lot of Walking Dead guests there, on top of the usual regular genre people that do these conventions, like people from Halloween and Friday Thirteenth. Was so, Daryl there? Oh, was that Daryl? Uh, no, no, because nah, he Norman, brings in the woman. Norman Reedus was not there. <laughs> he brings in no. the ladies. Michael Rooker, who was actually uh, on our flight, he brings in the ladies. <laughs> he repels, <laughs> man. Oh, really? No, I, I can see it. Uh. I think he's like got that like girls like him because he's crazy sort it's of intense. thing. Yeah, yeah, he's intense. Yeah, he's got this intensity uh. that's kind of alluring. But yeah, um, so he was there. I, I think because of the popularity of the show and the fact that a lot of them, you know, were, were there. I think that drew the biggest crowd. I'm guessing, and there were a few Star Wars people there too. I guess you know, in the heat of the announcement, but, right. um, but no, I mean, it was a fun show. It was fun to see people on the East coast. I had, um, the icons of fright crew come and met, met me over there for a little bit, but, um, definitely I don't want to work one again. I would yeah. rather, are you kidding? Oh <laughs> I, my god! I'd rather go as a fan because Saturday I was stuck at the table from 9am to 7pm and we couldn't take a break, like no lunch, nothing. It was like, uh. <laughs> No, no breaks at all. Yeah, that's very um, standard for conventions. You do that the entire weekend. Yeah, I will say this though: I'm really disappointed in uh, Philly and Cherry Hill uh, horror fans. If you're listening, I'm sorry because your uh, horror trivia night is is pretty. I think it's pretty epic and special, and really hard because uh, we had these really promote these promotional tales from the crypt shirts that we made with fright rags that are FearNet exclusives. And we were giving them out, and we needed a way to give them out, so I decided trivia questions. That's a great way. Sure. So I started with Tales from the Crypt trivia questions because it's you know topical, and nobody could get any of them that I was I was throwing at them. I thought they were kind of easy, but I guess not. Uh, perfect example: uh, which Ocean's Eleven star was in an episode of Tales from the Crypt? And then I'd follow it up by it wasn't George Clooney, and it wasn't Matt Damon. Right. Wow. There you go. You got it. Okay. See, all right. All right. <laughs> Good. I was going to go Elliot Gould, but I, I pulled out. <laughs> I think someone actually said Scott Kahn. And I was like, oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> Who? <laughs> They're thinking of his dad, but it's no, okay. It's but, like, uh, but yeah, so, so then I went. I tried to get as easy as possible, and like nobody could get any of my questions. I was like, all right, the, who are the two actors that played Freddy Krueger? 
And people would get Robert Ingham, but they would never get Jackie Earl Haley. And I'm like, all right, let me try even easier. Oh, my hey, gosh. Hey, can we really blame them for not getting Jackie Earl Haley? Well, yeah, right. that was well, a little forgettable. He's easily overlooked he's as a human. He's not quite as iconic. Enough. Okay, but this one's funny. So so then I'm, I decided to start asking them, all right, well, what do you like? Let me, let me cater it. <laughs> What's your favorite franchise? <laughs> I don't think you can get this one wrong, though. You like so, Pumpkinhead. Let's do that. Yeah. Well, somebody's like, well, I like Rob Zombie movies. Uh, and I'm like, all right, cool. All uh, right, Rob Zombie movies. Who played Michael Myers in Rob Zombie's Halloween movies, who's also in Devil's Rejects? Uh, and was a guest here only and, three and weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And, yeah. he's, and he's signing right up the book. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I had to be like, okay, go up to that room over there. When you see a guy with a picture of Michael Myers behind him, look at his name, come back here, tell me that name, and I'll give you a shirt. I promise. So yeah, they couldn't. They couldn't get. You're too hard on them. I think you're just far too hard. These are not. These are not easy questions to you. We I tried just... the same thing at Comic Con two years ago at the Fango booth, where we were like, um, we had these awesome DVD packs from um, Shakarama, and we were like, okay, you know what? Let's do trivia. And no one was getting the trivia I was asking, and it was seriously things huh. like, on what street does Freddy hunt? Wow. And nobody was getting them, and wow. so finally, after a while, we were like, you know what? Let's have them do something else. So we would have them take a picture with a Fangoria posted on their Facebook page, and then they got. There you go. Um, See, I don't think it's worth giving TV. anyone anything. Once you're at that point, it's like you guys aren't even. You fans. guys just don't even deserve it. I think you should take something from that's, those people, like their shirt off their back. <laughs> You know, well, I mean, that's that's how I felt, and I think we did a thing where if they liked our Facebook page, we'd give them something or just sign they up. They don't deserve page. to like your page. <laughs> like, you should put a ban on them even pushing the like page. We're you know? very very exclusive about our horror. Yeah, fans. grow some horror and nads. I, uh, listen, I agree, and and it made me appreciate. The point is, it made me appreciate horror trivia night when I'm surrounded right. by complete fellow nerds. Yeah, I may call us nerds. Yeah, yeah. I actually a- I cut a Tales from the Crypt episode last question last time because um I when I was running them by Dave he said it was too hard. Wow. So what was it? it Do you was, remember? Yeah, it was um uh what actor played four roles in the same episode of Tales from the Crypt. It was uh, Tim Curry. Yes it was very Boom. nicely done. Tim Curry. <laughs> That's a great one, actually. Thank you, thank with, you. Uh, with him and Ed Begley Jr. Yes, death yeah. of a salesman. Yeah, or so, was, a death of some, of some salesman. And he played this like disgusting that. daughter sure. where he took off his <laughs> yeah. underwear, and it was like the most revolting thing ever. In a Tales from the Crypt episode, it was disgusting. Now, so, now to be fair, the show is like twenty years old, and I did just watch all seven right, seasons yeah, yeah. in a row, so I kind of yeah, have it fresh. fresh in my mind. That Lance Henriksen one—that's one I always think about with the uh, Russian roulette. Oh, yeah, that's I think great. that's a great mm-hmm. episode of TV. Yeah, and yeah. Kyle, I like Kyle McLaughlin in the desert with Kyle Vultures. McLaughlin did one. Yeah, I remember that's that a one. Great one. It, I just have little. Memories, yeah. Because I always so liked long the ago. tattoo one. There was a tattoo one where the tattoo yeah. uh, came to life, and I always directed liked... by William Friedkin. Th- oh, was that William Friedkin? That episode, did that? And uh, Tia Carrera is oh. in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, the other one that I always liked was Miss Autopsy, where it's huh. like these girls competing <laughs> for a beauty pageant, and that's what they're winning is Miss Autopsy. Yeah, Kathy Ireland oh, is cool. like the model in it. Yep. Yeah, my favorite's uh, the one with Christopher Reeve, where he has the diner. Do you remember this one? I don't and remember Judd, this one. Judd Nelson works for him. He's kind of like this weird, lowly guy. And uh, Meatloaf is is the <laughs> like the guy that's going to take away the diner from him, and then Judd Nelson starts serving this secret steak, and all of a sudden business booms, and it turns out it's Meatloaf, <laughs> like hanging in the freezer. He's serving <laughs> human steak. Nice. <laughs> My favorite episode was the one that had um, Harry Anderson. I had forgotten the name, but Rob told me during the break. Um, had Harry Anderson as the comic book um, artist. I guess he was an artist. He's an artist for Tales from the Crypt, the comic. And he was show. drawing his wife. Yeah. And I absolutely loved that one. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. The only the only cool again, the the flight to the convention was like a mini convention in itself because we're walking on and in first class is like Michael Rooker and then like behind him is like Lou Temple and then like Daniel Harris and oh, uh uh, who's sitting? Oh, and John Casir sat in front of us, who is the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Wait, that's Fearnet cool. flies that's you guys cool. first class? No, no, no. I'm saying as we walked through oh, okay. first class. I was going to say. And Rooker was the only one in first class. We're lucky Obviously. Fango pretty much like flies us steerage. <laughs> so. No, no, no. We, we booked our own flight. So, you At know. least Rooker wasn't the pilot. <laughs> Imagine if he turned around <laughs> going, hey, guys. <laughs> All right, I'm flying this thing. Henry, yeah, the portrait of a serial killer is going to fly this fucker. But the funny thing, I mean, we, we have a relationship with Kassir, obviously, because he, of Tales, and, and he did some of the new segments for us. But what was funny was we get to the hotel, it's like 11, 11.30 at night, everyone's exhausted, and me and Gavin are talking about Wawa, which is kind of like, if you're from the East Coast, or at least Jersey, 
kind of everybody like a, knows what a Wawa is. I would think. Oh, well, well, I guess not out here. For, for those that don't, it's kind of like a Wawa pedal. It's, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, then uh, I have no idea. It's Wawa. a place called Wawa. That's it's, it's kind of like a Seven Eleven if there was like a subway. It's like a sheet in it. But it's nobody knows what a sheets I don't know what that is. Okay, sheets we have in the South, and a sheets is like you get gas, but you can also get a sandwich and nachos and breakfast sandwiches and croissants and things like that. But it's like a Wawa. Yeah, pretty much. But Wawa, here's what I love is because they have a sandwich place inside the Wawa, mm-hmm. so you can get snacks and stuff, but you don't actually have to communicate with another human being. There's yep. a computer mm-hmm. there, and you just hit like Italian bread, you know, salami, lettuce, tomato, and then some dude at the end of the counter makes it for you. Mm. You don't actually have to talk to them. And he all they it. do, they call your number at the end. Like, that's it's it. Like 32. And then it's like my egg and white breakfast for sandwich is right there. We There's... interrupt this message to go back to the horror show. <laughs> that was a okay. There is a point. Uh, Reason being, it's like 1130 night. We're in the <laughs> lobby. And John Kassir over here is this. And he's like, hey, man, you guys going to Wawa? And we're like, yeah, you want to come with us? And he's like, yeah. So we ended up going and getting sandwiches at 1130 before with the, the convention. Keeper. With the Crypt Keeper. That's yeah. pretty cool. That is very so, cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's so, way cooler than seeing Angie Everhart at the park playing with her kid <laughs> and kind of semi stalking her and kept thinking. Poor Are you devil talking blood, from experience, Elric? I am. Okay. Yeah, I saw Sam Elliott at Magnolia Bakery this week. It was. Um, I, I was. Wait, a, has he been on a horror film? I don't. He must have been right with I'm that many sure, film credits. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure somewhere. somewhere. There, okay, that's our writing film. question. Put on our Facebook wall when you hear this. What <laughs> horror film was Sam Elliott in? I'll, I'll find a good prize to send you. I'll pull some DVDs from the DVD closet. And there you send go. Send you something good. Yeah, he mm-hmm. must have been. And we just got the entire... Maybe one of the Tremors sequels, right? <laughs> he would have been perfect for Tremors, you know? Somewhere in there, so. Yeah. He was buying banana cake, which just made me giggle, because it's not banana bread. That should be our new segment, Celebrity Sightings of the Week, on yeah. top of what movies we've seen. And they have to be about food. They all have to be tied <laughs> into food. Like the day I saw Gary Busey eating a roast beef sandwich at the Grove, it was pretty epic. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So, But that's one of the great things about living in LA, is you kind of get these rare celebrity sightings but it's never anybody like you know you're not going to see like you know brad and angie walking down the it's street it's going to be eric roberts yeah it's going to be eric <laughs> which is way more which awesome. is cool anyway yeah you know, it it's, is it's or always... larry visser yeah what? right wasn't larry visser <laughs> you saw larry visser uh, wasn't no wasn't he at the trivia night who's the guy is he the, am i thinking the wrong guy or the friday guy yeah oh larry zerner is larry zerner who's oh. also a guest at uh at uh, at Monster Mania, uh-huh. so I hung out with him for a little bit there. Shelley. Very cool. He's the one that screamed out, uh, "Suck it, rednecks!" When we yeah, missed the question. That's cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, Elric, what did you see this week? Yeah, speaking of food, food. Yeah, I saw. Um, you know what? I I, I just always assumed I had seen Blood Diner before, and it turns out that I'd seen the poster for Blood Diner because <laughs> I had and memories now... <laughs> of a movie that took place in a diner in the middle of nowhere with a guy picking his teeth with a toothpick. But I realize that's just a picture. I've seen that poster. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> as it was one of those childhood missed memories from a VHS cover. And I know I'm not kidding. I really, I think I actually had him in a weird way in my head mixed up with Motel Hell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All these years. I and can see that. And it's so different. I mean, it's so funny. Uh, Blood Diner, you know, to me, and we are about to talk about best worst movies and or So Bad It's Good. And we're going to talk about the whole concept. And I, I, I have heard that this one had been lumped in in some ways, but it certainly doesn't deserve it because it's a genuine comedy. There's no way this person set out to make a straight horror film. But there are moments that are kind of terrible that somehow work. Like the opening is just insanely ridiculous. <laughs> um, but there is one scene in this film that I thought it might be up there now with my favorite scenes in the history of celluloid. In fact, when I saw wow. it, I said, this is the best thing I've ever seen, which is uh, the guy who's been spying. on uh, uh, Blood Diner is about a diner where they are trying to resurrect uh, the spirit uh, I don't know what it's kind of like a mummy. It's there. It's it is some Egyptian. It's mummy. Um, actually, it's supposed to be a sequel to Blood Feast, right? But they Lewis's, changed their minds, right? Yeah, but they changed the the, the <laughs> creature that they're resurrecting right. midway through. Yeah, the, I think I read something about the production was a sequel until like two days before shooting, oh, and wow. then they change it, and they're like, oh, it's not a sequel anymore to Herschel. Gold. Anyway, uh, they're resurrecting this thing by, by feeding uh, human uh, parts to the people who go to this diner, which is an inner city diner. And has nothing to do with the poster, which makes it look like it's a diner in the middle of... It's not even a diner. It looks like a square room right. where they're serving food. Um, but uh, there's a scene in there where the guy who's been spying on them trying to steal their uh, menu, uh, he gets both his hands cut off and he gets straight <laughs> into the car to run away and he can't drive because he's got no hands. <laughs> and the wheel just goes from side to side and he goes right into a mountain and the car explodes. And I'm like, come on, that is... Like, there's no way somebody accidentally... This is where we're going to talk about so bad it's good. There's no way that that is an accidentally badly shot scene. That right, scene is right. just 
hilarious, you yeah. know? And I really thought genuinely that was probably the hardest I've laughed in a long time, that one scene. But there was, you know, there's parts that are dated and just, it's wacky. It's it's a weird movie. Yeah. But there's something about it that's very lovable. I see why people would fall. The cop character who, who speaks in a high-pitched voice, uh, you know, it's just like, wow. Like, you know, how does, how does a movie like this come about? It's, but this no. movie never really got a DVD release. No, I did. thought it was a Vestron film, but it, it was probably on its release. Yeah, it's on. It's on. Uh, I think it was only on VHS and bootlegs on mm. on DVD. Yeah, I have. A, I'm holding think, a bootleg. No. I think there's a. I dare I say an HD version of it because mm. I know we aired it on Fearnet. Yeah, and that's the way I watched it. Was I went through our archives and saw it. And I was like, oh cool, I haven't seen Blood Diner since I was yeah. kidding. I had the same memory as you. I for some, Weird, huh? I kept confusing it with Motel Hell. Yeah, and then when I watched, it, I was like, oh, this is even more yeah, brilliant. Yeah, totally, it's such a different movie. <laughs> wow. yeah. Which also makes sense now because I posted that picture from the Fright Rags table and the first, he's like, I just seen it. You're like, buy me that Blood Diner. Oh man, shirt. I was <laughs> I was hungry for it when I saw that. I was just like, oh, I need that, and then it's too late. <laughs> so we'll just break to give a, a big plug to Fright Rags, Ben and yeah, Christy, just kind of roll. So. It's fright-rags.com, and I'd say 99% of my clothing is from them. So. I have, um, they also have a Slaughter High. I, yeah. Yeah. I bought the Slaughter High shirt. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't have to say, um, Christy sent um, my unborn child some some awesome Fright Rags t-shirts that she's going to be sporting. That's right so, on. Yeah, so she's going to be totally well-dressed. But, um, you know, when I was in college, I actually, um, back to Blood Diner, I had a goldfish named Little Jimmy Hitler, mm. and I used to have to explain to people what Where that, that was from. from. Yeah, because <laughs> nobody knew. It was just like my joke, my goldfish, Little Jimmy Hitler. Well, we was all, we've also, we're doing a little piece on this uh, later that we'll reveal later why, why we're doing it, but uh, one of the people I found out through Twitter when I wrote that about the greatest scene ever, uh, the guy who <laughs> re retweeted it straight away was Carl Crew, the lead, one of the two lead brothers in the film. Oh my God. Uh, and who apparently, from what I could find out, now owns a nightclub in Hollywood called CIA. Oh, I think he might be my Facebook friend right yeah, now. Yeah, Carl Crew. If I'm not mistaken, because totally I mentioned Blood Diner. Pretty Blood cool. Diner he's, the, he's the one who just grunts through the whole film and eats people. He's not the brother who's actually kind of the lead, He's the, who died in an accident a long time ago, actually. But it just, just interesting. It's great when he tweets something and the person just on it. Like, yeah. two seconds later, he's trolling for Blood Diner references. <laughs> That's you know? awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But. Wow. I, um, my watching was not quite as eventful this week. I have family in town cause I'm about to give birth. So, um, mm -hmm. horror I, family. Yeah, actually they are <laughs> horror fan, somewhat. Um, I def my family is definitely horror fans. So we watched possession, uh -huh. um, the new film that just came out oh, uh, yeah. on DVD a couple of weeks ago, which I had seen at the screening, um, back November, October, something like that, right before it came out. And, um, actually I'm sorry, it was September. And so I hadn't seen it since then, so I watched it on DVD, and it did not get much better. Mm. But oh. my parents liked it. Mm. Yeah, I liked I liked the first like half of it. Yeah, they, I thought the setup was really nice. It just once it went into the Judaism horror, I remember kind of going, "What?" It was it just kind got of. To, I liked the Judaism aspect or Judaism aspect of it. Um, I liked the Dybbuk box just because I thought that was kind of an unexplored. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. The, fright, the, the, but, the the setup was good, but then when the actual payoff of how it all went down was yeah, and the monster when when you finally saw the yeah. creature, it was really digitized. Yeah, so. but well directed. The one that it was one of those movies I remember coming out of going, "Wow, I thought that was really well put together," mm -hmm. but it didn't quite as a, the story didn't quite grab me. So, and that was a foreign director uh, who'd made like these really intense dramas in his own country. Yeah, hmm. Oli Bornadel. Have you seen it, Rob? No, I haven't seen it yet. Um, it's not bad. I, it's, I mean, I, I see it eventually, but I mean, it, it looks from what I've seen, like, kind of, well, like I've seen that already, you know, it's not, you probably have, it doesn't look like something like I'm dying to see. So, but I mean, it did well enough there. They gave, that's the slot that they gave your next, mm -hmm. uh, this year, just because they're like, Oh, we opened a horror movie at the end of August. That, that must be a good time to open them. Which segues perfectly into what's been going on at South by yes, Southwest. Oh, next. I guess that. Tell us. Yeah. Um, tell, tell you what about it. <laughs> tell us what's been going on well, we, at South we, we, Bay because we're not there. All three of us have spent the week at South Bay. We've been in Austin. That we're actually recording this one remotely, and we just I got wish. out of Evil Dead uh, five minutes ago. Yeah, and, yeah, that's that's totally. We're like the only three people who missed everything. <laughs> yeah. Lucky you have us in a room recording yeah. a podcast. But uh, we are hearing a lot of good things. I mean, obviously, Evil Dead instantly. I was trying. I'm still trying to stay away from footage. I just want to see it. Oh, you haven't even seen the trailers or anything, right? I watched the first like thirty seconds and then said, "No, Ooh, I don't want to okay. see it." Yeah. I really want to see this. They're film really fresh, good you know? trailers. Yeah, they yeah. are. <laughs> I'm really excited to see it. 
but you know it was great and uh, it seemed a little polarizing with some people but 90 percent saying yeah you know? yeah the, the reviews have been pretty solid yeah intense intense is a great at least the people that whose opinion matter to me right you know? so in other words no one cares Devin Karachi. <laughs> but we get to go screen it <laughs> oh, did in one week did you not like him? him yeah that figures yeah yeah we get to go to a screening of uh evil dead in one week so That's we should true. be yeah it's like next friday oh so can we, i come yes i didn't know about this so you gotta sounds good we'll, we'll totally get you in sweet um, that one, uh, but the, some of the surprises have been a film called Cheap Thrills uh, yeah. that is getting really great buzz. Yeah, everybody's been talking about mm -hmm. this one. I don't know much about it. Um, yeah, uh, Evan Katz directed it. Mm -hmm. It's his directorial debut, um, and he is a writer. Um, and I think it was written by Trent Haga. Right. Actually. Really? Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty yeah, sure he did this. Wow. Co he co-wrote the screenplay with Evan. I love Evan. Trent. Yeah, Trent's great. And it looks kind of like... Um, I've heard comparisons to like Haneke, like like mm -hmm. the funny games kind right. of stuff. And Pat he, Pat Healy's the lead. He was in um, what you call it? Innkeepers and mm -hmm. Compliance. Yeah, as the kind of MacGuffin and Compliance. Yeah, he. I mean, I think he's one of the best. I mean, AJ Bowen's always going to be probably my, one of my favorite screen. You know, love that, and not just because people in this circle know him, but I really actually thought that before I even moved to LA. I remember mm -hmm. seeing uh, the signal and thinking it was um, Ryan. <laughs> what the Ryan Reynolds. I, did. Ryan Reynolds. I truly did like for real <laughs> that's how how few Ryan Reynolds films I had seen at that point right, right. but um no I, I think Pat Healy's got such good range yeah. like he can play so many different sides and usually kind of unlikable there's a, n a nice thing about him that makes him a little prickly and yeah um, yeah. yeah, I think it looks good. And, and then the, um, uh, the daughter of uh, John Cassavetes and Jenna Rollins, the big independent filmmakers, uh, Kiss of the Damned, she has this uh, film that's Get, it sounds like kind of like an art house vampire film. Yeah. And our um, Fangoria rep who's there, Sam Zimmerman, said that it was like the most hot erotic thing he'd ever seen. Wow. Yeah. 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 So he said it was amazing. Sam's a youngin though, so he, he, he might not have seen as much as we He's have. He's like mid-20s. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it takes a lot for us to go erotic now. <laughs> but it's nice to get away. Like, you know, I've just been waiting for vampires to kind of be reclaimed and yeah. get away from the that romance sparkly side you know it's nice if we're going to let's get to that you know hot erotic lesbian vampire thing. sure that's yeah. that's yeah we need to get let's vampires to back to the lesbians exactly yeah. let's get it back to where it belongs <laughs> you know um but yeah so that's well that's south by southwest wrapped up wow there you go <laughs> so look out for any of those films lesbian vampires uh we're gonna turn our conversation toward uh, towards our where our guest is coming from but um so bad it's good i'm gonna start this so bad it's good mm -hmm. best worst movie mm-hmm <laughs> Give us your thoughts. <laughs> Rob seems very kind of pessimistic on this one. I, I, do, I mean, I don't know. I, <sighs> what do those words even mean to you? If you if you see the m words best worst movie, would you go to that film? No, no, really, no. Because if because well, here's here's the thing, and this is going to go into my my opinions on Birdemic because I I tried watching it for right. this show because you know the first one. Let's be the clear. One, yeah, uh, our producer, the, the guest today is the producer. Has made the, the sequel. second one. The Nothing sequel, to do with yes. the first. Nothing to do with the first. But I tried watching it because it's on Netflix Instant, and I lasted a total of twenty six minutes, and I only lasted that long because you were you were trying because you were tweeting to you, that telling you, were you. <laughs> to me during <laughs> it. Keep <laughs> going, <laughs> Rob. Elric kept tweeting to me, and I was like, oh. "You can and, do and it." Was, no, it's just it's not it's not it's not even a movie. It can't even be described. Did you make it to the clapping scene? Uh, no, I don't think so. Is that in yeah. the first twenty minutes? I mean, I don't even remember where I stopped. But you didn't get to birds. You didn't get to any violence. I, well, right? then I fast forwarded to see what the fucking birds looked like. For right. Christ's sake! Right. That was one of my <laughs> one of my tweets to him. Is are there any birds in this movie? Right. And he's like, yes, keep watching. Um, so I fast forward to see the badly animated birds. But I don't know. To me, it's like th there's two reasons why that angers me. One is that you know. For 99% of my life, I have not made a decent income at all. I've been bordering on poor. Mm -hmm. So when I go to pay to see a movie, like I'm just not one of these types that's like, oh, whatever, it's so bad, it's going to pay my money. No, I want to be entertained and see an actual movie. And twofold, working at a video store and seeing people come in and spend their hard-earned money on a movie like this, when I know there's 8 million other things in the cult section that I would rather them see... It's just, I, it's like, that's where I don't understand human beings and what they do with their money and what they find entertaining. And that you, have you seen Troll 2? You know what? I, I mean, I have, but I don't remember because remember. I actually like Troll 1, kind of. I right, yeah, too, when I saw it when I was a kid. And Troll 1 and 2, neither of them stuck out to me as horrible movies when I was like 7 and 8. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but Troll, Troll 2, when you see it, it's it's like, you know, this I weird mean, magical it. experience. I've owned for years the Troll 1, 2, you know, double yeah, feature. Does. And I think that's when I first saw Troll 2, whenever that first came out, like 10 years ago, whatever. But I never thought anything of it. And to now all of a sudden have like this fancy special edition of just Troll 2 
It's just, it just isn't, I don't understand, you know? Yeah, and well, what I think part of this is about, and I, I can't speak to you because obviously you're coming at it very specific to your, uh, you know, feelings towards it, but I do think that these are hard, we were talking about it before, I do think these are very hard films to watch maybe uh, by yourself mm -hmm. uh, for the first time, especially Bird Demo. I can't even imagine seeing it like that, but I saw it in a crowded <laughs> room at midnight and there was something about the humor of it that caught on and there's it's something about and and it definitely extends to number two. The, the, watching a film, there's a basic film grammar that m even bad movies tend to get right. You know, mm -hmm. the basic film. And this was like watching someone who got every moment of film grammar just slightly off, off by like a couple beats, long enough that, for instance, if it was on a reaction shot, it cuts to you. You're talking, I'm talking. Reaction, reaction. Conversation ends. They linger on a face for like two seconds you're in character a second later you're no longer in character and the camera's still on you and then it cuts and that it was just this feeling and there's something that i don't know where well, i don't know i can't define why it's funny but especially in a group setting right there's something and so they are i would go so far as to say they are event movies okay um and i i, I can't maybe not troll 2 troll 2 i think is actually kind of just saying that if it's came on you're just kind of transfixed by how weird it is that that's i would say so, so weird it's good rather mm -hmm. than so mm -hmm. bad it's good there's a definitely a difference it's just a very strange movie like at every point you don't know how the hell the writer could have come up from one beat to the next yeah you know? Uh, what do you? Uh, what about you, Becca? This is something that we've had very, I mean, very heated arguments at Fangoria about, um, and a lot of times it's Chris and I, you know, try to support movies that are so bad they're good, and I know Mike Gingold is always very adamantly against them, and I, I honestly, I kind of agree with him to an extent. Where um, the belief that you know we we try to put forth at Fangoria is. We support good filmmaking. Mm -hmm. We try not to give accolades to bad filmmaking. We want people to see what is good filmmaking and do it right and push people to do that. And the reason for that is because we get so many that are like, well, we didn't really have any money and we didn't really have any boat audio equipment. So we're going to call it a grindhouse film. Yeah. Um, see, I fucking hate that. Yeah. That's, and that's I a hate, different topic because yeah. those movies, what's, yeah. well, what, what is interesting and the reason why there's a difference is how come some of these films develop a cult? 99% of them are just bad movies. And so no one ever uses so bad. It's good for the, you know, so many of these straight to sci-fi straight to DVD movies that most of us go, you get sent in the mail and you're like, Oh God, another one. They're not, no one's finding these films and saying these are entertaining. So, this is right. a very, very specific. Maybe there's like 10 From, or something movies yeah. that kind of fit this bill. So, there's something about them that is transcending just being a shitty film, which, and to me, it's they're all humor. It's always humor. None of them are straight and you're not laughing. I mean, all these films, people are laughing for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing to try to identify what sets them apart. And I also <laughs> think that there has to be an organicness to it. Like Birdemic, I mean, the, the director who made this seriously thinks he's making like Hitchcock. And um, I think that when you start with the intention of, well, we don't really have a budget, so let's just make a bad movie, that that's where it falls apart. Right. But if you look at something like Plan 9 or Man of Hands of Fate, that the, yeah. the people behind these films seriously thought they were making gold they believe yeah in the end well and we're gonna have jeff on probably in just a minute now but you know uh there's a commonality we're, we're all talking about the room mm -hmm. birdemic and troll 2 and mm -hmm. the one commonality is uh all three of the filmmakers english isn't their first language and uh all three of them absolutely believe they had made a masterpiece yeah. and still think they made a masterpiece even after their films have become basically jokes and audiences right. are going to laugh when they show up at these screens they just see the love they don't even see that you're being laughed at. And that's that's completely true. These And I find that to be, there's something I, I really do like about that quality to it. Um, that, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you you try hard, you made a movie. So I don't think, I, I agree completely with what Beck was just saying about the people who just do the faux grindhouse or whatever, just to make a movie, that cheapens everything. But when yeah. somebody has made something, and okay, so it's badly made, doesn't make it a bad movie. So the whole idea of best worst, maybe that doesn't exist because if it's best at anything, if it's making a whole bunch of people laugh, maybe it wasn't a bad movie to begin with. Yeah, it's I mean, something else. It's just, I, it I works could, on a different level. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can understand the argument, uh, which which counters my own. That look, at the end of the day, it's just entertainment. You know, right. like and how do there, you want to be entertained? There, yeah, there's really, I mean, when it comes to me sitting down and watching a movie, whether it's good or bad, I mean, there'll be things personally that I find good about it, but I just want to be entertained. You know, right. when I go to yeah. a movie, like I hate when people come out of a movie. And are just bitching like, oh, that sucked and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, really? There was nothing you liked about that? Like, not an actor, not a piece of music right. or a scene? Like, you're admitting that you just spent all this money and you didn't want to... It's like, you were defying getting entertained. So, uh, to me, was, it's like... What was the one that ended? The last time I felt truly ripped off. Like, truly like, no, 
no, you owe me something, was um, last year's Exorcism movie. Oh, The Devil Inside. Yeah. The Devil Inside, happening. totally. That was the last time I felt truly kind of, but, you know, really genuinely betrayed, like, by a gimmick or by people yeah. going, hey, I just yeah, got your money, right. so it's too late. Yeah. Too late, you know, and I just, you know, I despised it. So yeah. that's not to say it didn't have a couple of good scenes in there. There were, but but by the end, who cares? Yeah. If you're yeah. that mad, you know. I just get so annoyed. At Fangoria, we get so many press releases um, and movies from these, you know, low budget filmmakers who call themselves the next Ed Wood. And anytime I see something in a write up that <laughs> would says, that? The next, <laughs> you would be surprised. I swear, we get at least like two a month where the filmmaker says, you know, or the, the press team or, you know, his sister, whoever is writing it says, you know, this person is the next Ed Wood. And anytime I see that, I'm like, why would you call yourself <laughs> Even Ed that? Wood wouldn't want to be the <laughs> no, next Ed Wood. Ed Wood <laughs> thought, wanted to be yeah. Orson Welles. Exactly, exactly. Why would you aim want higher. to be Orson, you know, yeah. why would you want well, to be this Ed Wood? Yeah, you have to aim higher. So, wow. yeah, it's just kind of that's what I want to encourage, if anything, is don't set to make a bad movie, set to fucking make Citizen Kane. And if you stumble along the way, maybe it'll get some cult value. And our next yeah. guest is trying to make the Citizen Kane of bad movies. But this is a good question to him. We want to know if if he thinks these are bad movies or if, or if that term is the wrong term. If Are these are these just entertaining cult films that are called bad movies because of how they're made? So let's get his headphones on. Oh, and then, sorry. And you gotta then, look official. Put your oh, cans on. Whoa, Can you hear us again? Yeah, it sounds yeah. naughty, doesn't it? So we are being joined by Jeff Gross, like and he is the producer of Birdemic 2. The well, Resurrection. The Resurrection. Very important you say Birdemic 2, The Resurrection. The, the resurrection. And not James, a, James, James will go crazy. Yeah. James Wynn, when I mentioned James. Yeah, yeah, you could be clear. So let, for people who aren't aware yet of Birdemic and haven't seen past the first 20 minutes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, you know, what, what is it about these films that, what, what has it grabbed you? Why would you want to make, be in bed with a guy who you already know is crazy, you know? Why would you want to make a sequel to this film? You know, he might be listening. That's fine. <laughs> All the way from Vietnam. Anyway. Yeah. Um, well, Birdemic was, you know, I, to tell you the truth, I don't like bad movies. And when somebody tries to make, I heard a little bit of yeah, yeah, yeah. Judaism and eroticism. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got Let's the bullet point. I, I kind of missed the rest of it. Yeah. But, um, you know, <laughs> but you, I, I heard you say something, which was a good point, which was, you know, you set out to make a bad movie. I think they suck. You know, yeah. I didn't like the Grindhouse movies, yeah. the, the Tarantino picture, yeah. you know. Because of, like, it was obvious what he was trying to do. So I'm not like a Troll 2 guy. It's mm -hmm. good. You know, yeah. The Room, it's funny because it's such a horrible misfire. But those right. are really, really rare. Yeah, I think that's it. And so my wife was watching. Uh, so I don't like bad movies. I don't like bad movies. Okay. That's the preface. I think Birdemic <laughs> is fantastic. Uh -huh. And by fantastic, I mean entertaining, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if it's well-made, whatever, right? right. And by the way, congratulations on your new show. Oh, thank Thanks. you. <laughs> this is great. What, what, what episode is this? Number five. five. Yeah. Is this five? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> Get that out of the way. <laughs> yeah. It kept us around for five so far. What an honor. Okay. Well, we may end it tonight. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, so my wife was, uh, she loves The Soup, the show mm -hmm. with Joe McHale. She saw a clip of Birdemic on The Soup. She right. goes, honey, you got to watch this. I go, you know, I don't, and I'm not into bad movies. I don't want to see it. I don't care. And she goes, no, no, let's just watch it. So she watches it. She brings me in. And it was such a beautiful misfire that it was so sincere, obviously yeah. sincere and authentic. And, you know, after watching it, I enjoyed it. I watched it a second time, and then we started quoting the movie. To right. Oh, you know, I said to my wife, you look great in those lingerie and other <laughs> movies, other lines, you know, which was weird because I have not sort of let any, any kind of like different kind of vernacular or anything enter into my lexicon or how my uh -huh. conversations go since uh, a guy named Mike Mitchell, a director, gave me a couple of tapes called Shut Up, Little Man. Mm-hmm. Back in the which was recorded, I think that's streaming illicitly. on Netflix. That's know. a great documentary, yeah. by the way. Check it out. It's from Australia, but it's streaming. Hmm. Um, and so nothing, you know, in ten years had really interested me like this, you know. And before that, it was Midnight Run, where I was just going, oh, yeah, "Can we yeah. curse on this show?" Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Fuck yes. All right. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, I, I just became enamored with it. Started uh, looking up, and, and by the way, let me say, I, I worked in on big pictures, but I sort of retired. I, I decided I never wanted to work on another film that I didn't need to see, right? 
So I had no interest in, in doing a movie. Contacted James. Just asking him. He had no idea who I was. I didn't tell him. Contacted him and said, what is going on with Birdemic 2? Because I saw on the web that he was doing right. it. And, you know, I got to the point. James is an interesting character, by the way. I have to learn how to speak out of both sides of my mouth. Because he's going to be <laughs> right. sitting next to me for all these Q&As all right, over right. the world. We're going to the countries. Um, and it was, it, you know, it was just so fascinating, fascinatingly atrocious, but so wildly entertaining. I asked him, what are you doing? He, he said, oh, it's getting made. Don't worry. Now, I know Hollywood talk, and I mm-hmm. knew he was full, right. of, full of shit. Flailing. I can say Flailing. shit, yeah. right? So that wasn't real. So I decided, okay, I'm going to have a meet with him, you know? Yeah. Just to sit with him and see. Maybe I can help the guy, because I'm dying to see Burdemic too, because... He said he had a story, you know, he was on your show, right. Elric, and uh, Inside Horror, and, you know, he was telling you, you know. He told us he was already shooting it in 3D. Uh, yeah, oh, right. Really? He, said, he said, I am master of the 3D. Yeah. That was, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll get it to ask me again about the 3D thing, because right. we did not shoot this in 3D. No, right. But I sat with him, and James loves, James is authentic, sincere, authentic, okay? So there's... Uh, there's crazy, and then there's like um, delusionally beautiful. Right. Maybe you could call it. I, I like that term. So when you, which one, shit or a delusionally, okay, delusionally beautiful? Yeah. But really, no, no. But but it was wonderful because you could tell. And I was wondering, like, is this the world's greatest troll? Is he such a genius? No, no, nobody. No, because if he was that good, he would have done Munich or something. Right. You know, so or use his talent. So you know, I sat with him. And the first thing I asked him was, why do you think people like Birdemic? Why are people who are, are loving Birdemic, not you, but, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about, but, uh, you know. Who, who not do, yet. Not He's a work in progress. Well, no, no, it's okay. You don't have to. Because, <laughs> hey, maybe number two will win him over. No, but, but you did say something. Right? It has to be entertaining. Right. To me, it was wildly entertaining. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't had that much fun seeing a movie since, you know, since... Yeah, like Midnight Run or whatever, right. or something. I don't know. Now, had I seen it in the way that you suggested a group, with yeah. a group of people at midnight, you got to yeah, see. maybe I would have been like, at oh, least you would have gone through it. I yeah. think the thing is getting through it. I think I really don't think I would have watched it all the way because I don't even get through sci-fi originals all the way most of the oh, time. Oh God, you know? no, I can't make it. I watch like, like ten minutes and go. Uh, you know? well, I, I saw I, I saw yeah. it with my wife mm-hmm. and the the first mm-hmm. one, and just being a movie guy, right. the first just the first title that came up, the way that happened, the pandemic, right. and the way he repeated the score. Uh, I I was on the floor. Right. I was howling. Right, I couldn't right, right. stop stop breathing. So I actually didn't watch Birdemic that first night. I only watched the first three minutes. <laughs> and my wife kicked me out of bed at three in the morning because I was heaving. Right. Still, like every every twenty minutes, I would wake her. You know, and the bed would shake. <laughs> I got through it. Right. Uh, but anyway, I, I became so enamored with it, and I understood why people really liked it. So when I met with him, I said, "Do you know why people who love Birdemic?" embrace it so and he told me uh and this is the only thing he could have told me where i would have been interested in the sequel or even helping him or doing anything he said despite the i'm not it wasn't this eloquent but (laughs) (laughs) despite the lack of production value there is something in the movie that people connect to and that was it and he's right Hmm. now truth be told he does see himself and he's He's told me this over and over. He's put it in writing, and and I'm sure you guys know this. Master of the romantic thriller. Master of romantic. He's trademarked it. Trademarked it's it on for many poster. thousand dollars. Wow. Exactly. Master of the romantic Master thriller. Master of romantic thrillers. Yeah. I had to get it right. Oh, okay. Actually, on his own website, on Movie Head, he probably Epidemic, it. it changes. So I actually don't know which one's <laughs> trademarked, but what the hell? I put yeah. one of them on the poster. So yeah. <laughs> with, with, the, with the superscript. So, um, you know, I... Uh, I, I realized through this conversation that he 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 completely believes he's Hitchcock. He really is Hitchcock without the 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 production value, without right. the without the budget. That's it. So his intent for a Birdemic to the Resurrection, he already had the story laid out. It was totally sincere. It was an extension of Birdemic. This was not some cash in. And although there are some good cash in sort of self referential movies, obviously Gremlins Two being the the one mm-hmm. I use. Um, this was in no way it. He 
He was sincere. There were no in jokes, nothing like that. Which he is what, what a lot of universe. people have been worried about, and that's one thing you can we can dispel before you know, it comes yeah. out. That's it. You well, can I say that you two have seen a working yeah. print of it? You were one of a handful, right. and yes. you know this is. Yeah, completely sincere, and and I even and, thought it was. I thought you were going to go down the road of having cameos and in jokes. No, the only only it's not a cameo. It's just people come back. You know, and I know group. a lot of people were worried that because um, the second one is about Hollywood, mm -hmm. that it would be much more self referential, and yes. that it would be calling attention to the art of filmmaking and uh -huh. the tricks that they use to make it so bad. But in in the other way, it's just it's like virginal eyes of Hollywood. It's like exactly. what I thought Hollywood was when I was it, six. exactly. It's his view of how Hollywood right. is and should be. Brain and, damaged and, Billy Wilder. It, there you go. Yeah. Very good. And there is a Billy Wilder element to oh, it. I don't is, want to yeah. give anything yeah. away, but his homages, he sort of missed the point of the actual <laughs> homage <laughs> of what the thing was. I didn't even catch the homage. Yeah. I kind of had to tell you later, yeah. but there's a couple, there's right. a few homages that I didn't even realize. Right. But I knew he was doing it, and then I'm, la I'm laughing to myself. So, because I'm like, oh my God, he missed the point. But what, what turned, I'm thrilled with Birdemic 2, The Resurrection, by the way, because it was sincere, and I needed Rod and Natalie to come back. So, uh, James pitched me the story, you know, and James speaks in very simple, like old school Hollywood. You have to option this, and then we make a deal. So, Fuck it, I optioned it, you know, on Birdemic 3, if there's ever going to be one. And it would not be self-referentially as right. the idea of what would happen next. Right. So, and that would be 3D. I put that in the contract, too. So, we, so, <laughs> right, I, right. so I got rid Master of that. Master of the 3D. Yeah. Master of the 3D. Right. So, well, that should be, that, that'll be its own experience. I, I thought it would be tough enough to get through a movie with him right. alone. <laughs> as far as you know, it was a pure pleasure throughout, right? Right. But, um, uh, so... He was not self-aware, you know. I but mean, how do you? Sh and the thing I I was most interested from the start of hearing about this because you know I actually had a, as we talked about I had a sit down meeting with him and everyone would tell me oh he's crazy this guy's crazy and I remember as soon as he talked about finances I knew he wasn't crazy he he was I know he's completely sane he's just like you said he has an, yeah. a dream that you know maybe the talents aren't equal at, the at our first meeting at the Hollywood Happy Ending where he always has to have a meeting because that's yeah. where. Meetings take place, right, right. right? He never heard of Musso and Franks. He never heard of it, right. right? So that's where meetings <laughs> well, take place in Hollywood. And it actually appears in, in the, the film. film. Had to be. Too. Had that to be. That is crazy. He, I have never had a meeting at the yeah. happy ending. I've had <laughs> beer at the happy ending, yeah, but never like, a, you know, a Hollywood he, meeting. Exactly. Right. And we had to film there. We had to because that's Hollywood to him. So you will see his view of Hollywood, and it's sincere and honest and I think innocent and obviously batshit crazy, but in that sincere way. So anyway, I sat with Lionsgate. I'll just tell you this right uh -huh. off the bat. Once I optioned the thing and I said, look, I met with him. It's his way or the highway. Believe me, to make this work, this has to be 100% him. He has to have final cut. He has to just do everything that he wants to do, and I can manage the production. And Lionsgate says, this sounds fascinating, but we can't just write a check. So we'd, you know, we'd come in and give notes and I go, it just won't work that way. So, you know, um, James, by the way, when, when we met at the Hollywood ending, you say, Oh, he has his faculties about him. Right. I asked him, okay, so the budget, he says, I can make it for a million dollars or 200,000. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's absolutely true. Right. So I said, I said, okay, well, okay. So right. You know, give me the budget. So the next time we met, he gives me the budget on a napkin with three line items. I don't think he knows the term above the line, but basically 100000 above the line, 50000 whatever, whatever, right? So I'm like, oh, fuck, I got to do a budget. I got to, I got to realize this is going to be a lot you more work. You actually have to produce I, this. I, I actually, oh I, like, wow, Real this work. took a year. This was a year and a half ago. I optioned yeah. in November of 2011, and we went into production in February, and, you know, he didn't find it necessary to be in editing so he ran to vietnam right after filming i was like uh you can't do that because hitchcock sit. wouldn't be in the editing room yeah that's what he said right so it was it was just what I would hitchcock do script. it'll yeah. come together so like we were going through the budgets we had arguments like you couldn't believe like he was adamant about the lens like lenses and this and where we were shooting and what we were doing so it was a negotiation now does he actually know a lot about the cameras that he's using or anything like everything that? that he knows is from google so <laughs> Actually, Birdemic is based on, you know, a, a story he read about birds attacking. That's right. And so there's new elements, as you know, in 
Birdemic 2, and that is all based on a story that he sort of misheard, in my opinion. And that's what's so great about this. He also mishears his inspirations. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the environmental, you know, things get... So all I, all I wanted to do was build him a bigger bus, build him a bigger bus, and, and let him drive it. And this was a big experiment that I think creatively absolutely has worked. I've shown it to a handful of people who are into this. And they oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean... You, it's there. So yeah, yeah. can I the, say... That's the same magic. Can I say... Thank you. Yeah, so can I, can I say he crashed the bus? I mean, that's what he did. Yeah, yeah that's definitely... And so I, I built him a bigger, brighter bus. This movie moves faster. It does everything. We had a lot more to do. We had to go to Universal Studios. We shot on that lot. But the thing I guess I, mean, I understand with audiences because the audiences are out there and go, oh, this will be this, this will be fun and in Birdemic too. I, in my opinion, won't struggle to find an audience in that sense. Mm -hmm. The thing about the production that I'm I'm just fascinated by is yes. how do you shield the director yeah. during the making of a film when everyone, including the two actors from the previous film, yes. are aware that yes. its popularity is based on being almost like a joke. Yeah. Of a well, film, well, you know? Alan is uh, a developing actor. Right. So he delivered Rod again. Right. You know, he wants to be Jean-Claude Van Damme sincerely. Right. You know, there's like a trio of perfection that I call it, which is uh, which is Alan James and Damien Carter, who's uh -huh. the, the, the singer. singer. The singer. The singer. And if it wasn't for those three, and not to say anything about Whitney, she's fantastic, right. but nobody else would have gone through an entire movie without a producer that first time than Alan and Damien. Right. So uh, it took a little more convincing for Whitney to come back, but she was really excited once she realized what, that there was a producer now right. and like she wasn't necessarily working for James. She was working for me. Any problems come to me, you know, and she was awesome in the movie. Of course they are a bit self-aware, mm -hmm. but I told them anyone can turn and before we started, I said, look, anyone can turn and wink at the camera, right? Anybody can do that. Right. Your job as an actor is to give the director what he wants, okay? So that was my direction to them. So, you know, there's no, like, real winking, mm -hmm. you know, anything. There's a little bit of, <laughs> I can't believe we're doing this again, you know. Right, but, right. But, uh, but they all had a great time. I think it shows. But also, they sincerely delivered what James wanted. What about the crew, though? I guess the crew is the one that's even more interesting to me because, like, if you're the, initially, I'm sure he worked with probably very few people on the first yeah. one, and they have no idea what the end result's going to be. Here, yeah. you have made they have made a cult film, absolutely. Uh -huh. Like, no one would dispute that as a cult film. Yeah. Um, but they've done it in, in the first one, of course, accidentally, and now you're yeah. making a sequel. So, how did you keep everyone working for someone who clearly is somewhat delusional? Just give. Uh, wow, I hope James doesn't hear this. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. He yells at me anyway every day about some nonsense thing. <laughs> so, um, well, regarding the crew, I mean, it was just, you know, just give the director what they wanted. Really, mm -hmm. that was it. I mean, the crew did a great job. They didn't, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't anything. We actually got locations, mm -hmm. you know, like La Brea Tar Pit was a very yeah. pricey uh, but very important uh, piece of the movie, which Elric, yeah, yeah, you so. pop in that scene. Elric's got a cameo. If you Elric's blink. got a cameo. Of course, oh, of course he asked blink. me he asked me to, like second to last day of shooting. Hey, can I get a cameo? I'm like, well, we only have one day of shooting left, so <laughs> you're gonna be in the scene. Um in the tar pits, right? In the no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and Universal Studios. Super important. And by the way, Universal was super important, not necessarily because we were on the Jaw set, which was awesome to be on the Jaw set. Um, but because that's where Hitchcock filmed the birds. Right, right. Oh wow! Yeah, so it was super, super, super important. Hmm. He views himself as a great auteur, and in a way, he is. Yeah. He is so unique because you're right. You know, I've heard. You know, I'm friends with uh, Juliet Danielle from the Room, and from what I've heard and understand, like Tommy Wiseau is now self-aware. You know, uh, I think Claudio may be self-aware. I have no idea the guy who did Trump, I've, too. I've heard he still thinks it's a master art piece, you know. Well, whatever. He, yes, true. But he's been making movies since. Right, right. James, when I first sat with him, I said, have you filmed anything since Birdemic? Have you basically learned anything? He said, no. I said, fantastic. <laughs> Let's jump on that. You know. <laughs> so, you know, Alan said the same thing. He said he had two requests for the movie only. Alan's such a sweetheart. He had two requests for the movie only. One of the requests was, can I get an acting coach this time? And I said no. Yeah. So I said yes to his second one. Yeah. <laughs> what was the second request? 
Uh, yeah, I can't repeat it. it okay. It was, um, well, there was some awkward, there's some, uh, it Make was, it was scene. a personal. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. He was just concerned about, you know, how he came off mm-hmm. because he does view himself and his future as a John Claude Van Damme. He didn't want to get beaten up and, and what have you. So, God, you got to love filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to do Don't this, you? I realized, so I committed to the film. I told my wife, she goes, you know what? I told you never to do another movie. You got to do this one because this wasn't happening unless I did it. So uh, I committed to doing it. I did everything that's the uh, opposite. Never, never work on a sequel where you didn't work on the original. Never start with a <clears throat> quote unquote terrible script. You know, a, a lot of these that never start without distribution. But I realized to get the film that James Wynn needs and that the audience deserves the authentic, sincere, no bullshit sequel to Birdemic, the extension, I had to do this really myself. I didn't know where I was getting the money when I committed to it. I didn't know how this was getting distributed. And by the way, right now, we're self-distributed. Unfortunately, theaters are booking all over the country. It's fantastic. We have a residency in New York. I think Cine Family, as you know, March to kick 20th, start, yeah. mm-hmm. is already sold out, which is great. Oh, that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's sold out. They said, uh, Hadrian told me, like pretty much record time. So they'll be carrying it more. But right. I think that, uh, you know, it, it's an event thing. People got to go see it together. So we, I think you should come. I think we should just go. You could even skip the first and we'll just take him into the second. And you know, it. you come know, on, the, yeah. I'll Here, even come. Let me give you a and, little, let me give you a little thing. You don't need to see Birdemic to see Birdemic. To under to get Birdemic too. Understand it. It's me, actually funnier if you don't, because there were a lot of chunks where they referenced Birdemic one that I had completely forgotten, and so there were a couple lines that I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" Just because I didn't necessarily. Yeah. It was important for me to bring back the CEO, you know, the tree hugger, mm-hmm. and everybody. It was important to get a lot of people back, you know, because they're just audience favorites, and they're especially uh, Steve, the the tree hugger. Steve Gustafson is his name, is is a real theater actor and a lawyer. Um, And um, so he gave a very honest performance. And everybody, you know, anybody who was going to give me a wink, I said, stop that. Try it again. This is not a comedy. Do you think if you hadn't been there, James would have been able to pick up on that? Like when watching the actors, or do you think they could have done anything and he would have just let it? No, 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 no. No, James okay. is. James He's savvy is enough. Very, to oh, my God. You can't stray from the script. Okay. Yeah. Unless he tells you to stray from the script. Right. There's, there's scenes with uh, that he simply doesn't want to write. He calls it, uh, I don't know if Hitchcock said this, but he said to me something like Hitchcock said, the more you can tell without words, the better storyteller you are. So he calls it pure cinema. <laughs> And that's really his excuse. Well, for, I for, think that should be the title. Birdemic, the Resurrection, yeah, pure, pure Cinema. Pure Cinema. No, no, no. And that was something that he, a term he used all the time. Uh-huh. Whenever I said, can you, can you add, you need dialogue. You can't just, you know, I'm dead. She's dead. They're all dead. You know, right. can you add some dialogue? Pure Cinema. Very sincerely. Um, so I was like, you know, screw it. This is what James wants. Let's do it. So anything that worked under the budget, I gave him the tools to do so. I could tell you crazy stories, obviously, throughout the film, but that's for episode six. What about us? Uh, <laughs> um, are you allowed to, to recount the page a minute? The concept? page a minute. Oh, story. you like that story. I like the really page a minute good. because oh, that's man. a very, for all that's, the film students out there, you'll like that. Okay. James <laughs> gives me the, uh, James, uh, James delivers the first draft of the script and I'm reading through it and I'm wondering why there are huge white spaces <laughs> in, in, the, in the page. James heard that in his travels. Um, that uh, a, a script page is about a minute of screen time. So when he wrote the script, he wrote, for example, Damien Carter starts singing. You know, the, the line would be Damien Carter sings his song. And since it's a three, a four minute pop song, there's nothing else on that page. And then the next page says Damien Carter continues singing. Nothing else on that page. So it's an exact 90 page script. <laughs> But that's and that's what the movie is. It's a movie about a guy who thinks that this is what Hollywood's like. That's yes. what the, yeah. the content of the movie. Yes, and it translates into how he thinks a oh, script should be. This absolutely. You know, it's 90 this minutes, is how it's deals are minute. done. Yeah, this is how deals are done. I mean, exactly. No, and that really and very that's naive. A, you know, and you know, it, it's cute when you're watching it the movie that that's how he believes deals are done, like the million dollar deal. Yeah. But it's not as cute when he's like, I want no, it's a million dollars yeah. or it's this even number. He's very very serious right, about right. that. That was a bit of a challenge, you know, to kind of. 
you know, working with him. But we, we have a good working relationship and I think he's kind of lucky. Can I toot my own horn? I think he's kind of lucky he had me as a producer because anyone else would have, I think, maybe exploited this. Yeah, right. my um, husband, bit. who uh, was also with me when we uh, checked out the film a couple of days ago, said yeah. that you had to be a saint. Um, he was like, I don't know how that <laughs> man does that. It's Thank like- you. Well, I love Dave. Thank you. We <laughs> used this quote on the on the on the poster, by the way. Um, and uh, I'm glad he enjoyed. I, he's one of the handful who saw the rough cut, and I think he really enjoyed mm-hmm. it. By the way. He's been quoting it since so, then. We high five over everything now. Great, see, and that's it, going to happen. Stuck. It's stuck. No, yeah. no, no. So, so speaking of self-referential, by the way, and Elric, if I forgot your question, just ask it again. Uh, if, I don't if remember I, it. I know. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's been a it's been a long yeah, day. Yeah. But um, uh, so um, one of the things is people will be, I think, pleased about is that James reads reviews online, and he's okay with people calling it bad. It's almost like is two parts of his brain. So he, it's not registering, but he reads online, for example, uh, supporting casts that was in the very first title sequence. So I put it in the, we had the editor put it in the title sequence, supporting casts. Cause that's what I assume that's with an S at the end, uh-huh. as if there's more than one supporting <laughs> cast. James writes back. Absolutely. You know, no, it's supporting cast. Huh. So that's in the film. So James learns from the mistakes that he hears about, you mm. know, there's no, you know, traditional clapping scene like there was. And there, you know, he wouldn't even let the CEO who returns in the film in a slightly different capacity, even do that. I can't do the hand motion. Thing. Right. He's like, no, 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 nothing from Birdemic. Huh. Totally. Yeah. So it's kind of cool that there's no in jokes. James doesn't know what an in joke is. Okay. He doesn't right. know. So he was just, very, very sincere in his art. I mean, we would have screaming matches, meaning I was standing there and he was screaming. But <laughs> Well, I know. think it's partly because you can't. I mean, we. I would say it's probably pr- almost impossible to make a cult film. Yeah. With yeah. the purpose of making. So probably no, most wouldn't. people would have cast this to the hilt with Tommy Visu would have been in it. Exactly. You would have brought in every right. cult star and you would have gone, no. see, this is the ultimate bad no, we movie. Have, yeah, know? no, we had some people who wanted to be in the movie. Yeah. And uh, we ha- I said no, because it lo- looked like a gimmick. It wasn't a gimmick. This I movie is not a gimmick. I see what type of notes Lionsgate would have given. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. I, uh, you I know, just, <laughs> in my alternate universe, I want to read those notes. Just to be fair, I mean, they were very nice. It was, during, it was a micro-budget meeting, mm-hmm. you know, and they were doing American Psycho. Did that ever come? out their micro budget micro like mo- a sequel no, i were, think they were going to remake it a, a year oh, or they two were, ago as yeah. like a micro budget? yeah it's micro budget wow yeah did they make it i don't know no. anyway it was, it was during they were doing micro they were, were entering the micro budget thing we took a meeting and i was like i'm sorry guys it's not gonna work i you mm-hmm. know and i really shit i have to come up with a few hundred grand myself because this was a bigger thing you know and i wanted uh production value on screen. So, you know, it was a negotiation constantly with James, but James in the end got what he wanted on screen. Every time he thinks the story is better. He thinks the uh, action is better, but let me just tell you one thing. And this, this, this really should sum it up in my opinion. I heard you talking about how people try to, you know, Oh, we don't have much of budget. We'll make a bad movie and then call it a bad movie. No, this James win does not know how to make a bad movie. He knows how to make a great film and completely fuck it up, but he doesn't know how to make a bad movie. So that that's that's yeah, like very unique. I don't know anybody like that, and right. that's why James is such a national... Uh, well, no, I mean, I think, there are, I think there are. I think all those a Vietnamese guys, treasure? I think that's the, one of the commonalities. I'm sure, you know, when Tommy Visa was making The Room, you know, it was a totally different thing. I mean, yeah. he, he was a guy shooting it on HD and 35 millimeter at the same at time. At the same time. Because he didn't know which one was better. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and no one could give him a great answer. So he was like, well, I'll do both. And then I'll write a book about the differences. Which yeah. Which still hasn't come out. I can't say, wait. Whatever. Uh, but, you know, yeah. and he, you got the feeling that this is a guy who thought he was Tennessee Williams mixed with Marlon Brando. And yeah. he's making this movie, and you're just like, Jesus. And that's what's beautiful. Is exactly. That's a misfire. I call it the, tri- the, the trifecta of uh, wind sanity. Right. <laughs> which is troll to yeah. uh, 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 the room and Birdemic. Yeah, and they're also different, the humor. But, you know, I would have, I, I'd never do a troll 3 or troll 3D. They're all self-aware. It's all old and it's whatever. And But Birdemic spoke to me, and James was current and fucking just del- 
beautifully delusional and so sincere. I, God, he'd kill me if he heard me say this, but he even cried on the phone once saying, Jeff, we need this lens. This is my movie. Oh, This is a cinematic. This is it. This is my movie. This is, has to be it, you know? So I bought him this fucking lens. I got to try that tactic sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Producer, I really want this lens. You're a lot cuter <laughs> than James, so you wouldn't have to beg that much. Oh, hi, Dave. I'm talking to your husband, by the way. Do you, do you think when you go, well, I mean, the, the last part of, I guess, is the reaction from audience. Yeah. You're going to have to tour this. You're going to have to do Q&As with them. You guys are going to go do. around the world. When people are laughing at and maybe with, mm-hmm. you know, it's a mixture, I think. Mm-hmm. In uh-huh. films, sometimes you're genuinely laughing at it. Yeah. Sometimes you're laughing with it. Yeah. Uh, what does he hear? Does he just hear people? Like, does laughter just translate to, oh, they, they like my movie? Once I presented, I just stood up and presented uh, at a Birdemic Fest, the first movie, when we were just about to start uh-huh. Birdemic 2, just introduce myself and tell them why, how, what Birdemic means to me. And I said to the audience, I said, if Hitchcock directed a film in his current condition, <laughs> Birdemic would have been the result. <laughs> and the audience laughs, right. or whatever. it's a polite joke. But James hops up, hugs me, because I compared him to Hitchcock. <laughs> so, th- so there it is. Yeah. Okay, there it is. There, right. you know, so it's always sort of talking at it. But I admire the man. I think he's brilliant. I mean, just like you said, the, the, the script story that you like that uh, I told you, right. which is true. There are a million of those things where he just, you know, it was so important to shoot the, uh, as it says in the script, the Chinese man's theater. And yet he sort of didn't capture the top of it you know, like right. so he like there's so many moments like yeah. that 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 you could just eat up in Birdemic too. I'm gonna call it the Chinese man's theater from the now Chinese on. man's Maybe. theater. It's in the script. I'll give you a copy. It's it's very light. <laughs> <laughs> You'll save ink. But uh, are you okay? You're oh, I'm about good. To, she's rubbing her belly. I don't know. The, she's, she's, it, she kicks occasionally, and then it's just like a you know calm the fuck down. Rob, yeah, I'm gonna ask Rob. Can I can I say that? <laughs> can I say her? No, I won't say the. The, the, your daughter's name, but this is her first screen credit. I this gave her is. a special she thanks in Birdemic a, 2. She has a screen credit in Birdemic 2, which is awesome. Because you guys, uh, and I'm talking to Elric and Rebecca, <laughs> <laughs> such uh, supporters from day one that, that really, if it wasn't for people like you who really you know, understood what I was doing, I, I, I can't say I would have done the movie. I, c- yeah, I can't yeah. say. There was a lot of reasons not to do the movie, but the main thing was this movie needed to be made. The world of cinema needed this movie, <laughs> and I knew That's meeting true. with James and everything that it had to it had to be done. That he was so sincere, it had to be done. And I'm thrilled with the picture. So we're sold out March 20th. Yeah, the Cine family. Check uh, Facebook.com forward slash This Is Birdemic, or just regular Birdemic mm-hmm. uh, Facebook because they you know the the Severn boys who are not releasing this one, but they've been you know great fans of this. And mm-hmm. They. They are now putting when when we're announcing dates. Uh, the San Francisco premiere just went on sale. Uh, that's at the Roxy. That's April third, I think. So we're going to be touring all over the place. We have a residency. It's April tenth. I don't want to announce where, but it's a very cool, very cool, great theater, and we're going to have a premiere there April tenth. Are you allowed to tell people that you upped the ante on the sequel? Like, just kind of raise the stakes a little bit? As a, you know, sequels are always yeah. bigger. Oh, than my, the God. Yeah. oh right? my God. Oh, my God. They're always a little bigger. And did, I, did I not mention that part? Uh, when, when I met <laughs> with James, James said bigger to me, bus. James said, I said, yeah. okay, so tell me a bit about what you plan for Birdemic 2, the resurrection. And he said, well, first of all, it's a thousand times better than the original Birdemic. I said, how is it a thousand times better? And he said something just sort of whatever. And I went, okay. And he goes, but wait, it's a thousand times better than that. Then he told me the hook, which is the resurrection. And I went, James, you're right. Hang on. Let me get my checkbook. Yeah. So I actually wrote him. This is absolutely true. I wrote him a check right then and there just to option the thing for some money. More, I gave him more money for the option than he used for to make the original pandemic. And he goes, hey, can we go to Wells Fargo right now so we can cash it? I'm like, you want to cash it? <laughs> so, so we walk from Hollywood. Uh, uh, happy I want that ending. documentary. Yeah, he signed that. We walk yeah. to the Wells Fargo on you know Hollywood Boulevard or whatever or Sunset. Uh, shit, I can't remember Hollywood. Uh, There's Wells Hollywood. Fargo on Hollywood. Yeah, Boulevard. yeah, yeah. We walk there, and basically the guy looks at me as, as like 
gives me the are you being held up look you know <laughs> yeah. and i said i said no 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 the guy wants his cash give him the cash he's like yeah i gotta pay the hotel guy you know he's he's not the best financial manager so yeah. i did have to i did have to learn quickly to sort of parcel it out sort of like a dog you gotta give him treats yeah, yeah, when yeah. he's being good and when he's being bad right. you can't really he's gonna love that analogy uh, yeah exactly <laughs> no but i love dogs right, I, right. I have four of them uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, Rob, in terms of sincerity, because we were talking about before you sat down, mm-hmm. you know, are these even bad movies? Does, does sincerity like matter, you think, as part of this equation of uh, separating something that does become picked up and become a you know, popular cult film rather than just some of these movies that are just, yeah, I just made this film. Do I think sincerity? Yeah, I mean, oh, do you no, think that's, course. yeah, that's that's the part. Yeah. Of it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, if, I had, if I had a question, I guess it would be what... What's the key difference between the first one and second one besides yeah. what I assume is going to be production value? Meaning, yeah. we were talking before about how certain scenes play out funny because it's like, oh, one person says something, the other says something, and then the way it's edited is it, like, it holds a little too long. It's yeah. like he so, doesn't get the grammar. Of, I mean, I'm not saying he doesn't get it, but it's yeah. like the grammar film's wrong. Yes. Yes. Compared yes. to a normal film. It's uh, slightly off. Well, yeah, slightly you know, off. as you know, and if you've seen the, the first one, or the first 10 minutes, you know, the way the way that we think young people communicate and fall in love right. is not how James sees it. Right. So he phrases things interestingly, you know, and, and that's part of the charm. So yes, production value is heightened. The story is bigger. Um, so in one, in one way it's completely familiar. And on the other hand, um, it, it just moves faster. There's, we just did a lot more. We went to a lot more location. We did a lot in the movie. I think zips along a lot yeah. faster this yeah. time. So, and it, there's different actors at the start. So it does feel like watching a whole different film for the first like 30 minutes. Yes. Until, but the, Alan and Whitney are in it, but no, they are, but, but that was yeah. a good, this is a good thing. I think if it had just been the same main from the start, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have kind of gotten hooked. That's my, how you get into my it. opinion. You know, the thing is, you know, yes, we have new, new characters that come in and I think, uh, the two are just fantastic. Uh, Thomas yeah. Favaloro and uh, Chelsea Turnbow. Uh, she was like a Chelsea is like a working model. She's like the face of Vitamin Water. Yeah. And James There's some great angles on her. James doesn't. <laughs> yeah, we want, James we have to watch the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James doesn't see uh, beauty unless a woman is blonde. So I said, uh, Chelsea, you'd, you'd have to like wear a wig or dye your hair blonde, or, or you're not. James isn't going to cast you. And she said, Well, I, I wanted, to, I wanted, I want this movie. I want to do this. And so she called her agents. You know, she gets like eight grand for like a modeling shoot and I'm paying her 150 a day or whatever uh-huh. it was. And her agents were like, fuck, no, don't do that. You know, because you'll be blonde for two months. But she went for it. So she earned her stripes and she does a great job. Thomas also, oh my God, so, so lucky to have found Thomas in, in just straight casting. Um, James is not allowed on lacasting.com, by the way, according to him, do too. <laughs> Uh, uh, a misunderstanding. Mm. <laughs> He's an interesting cat. So, um, so what would this film have to do to yeah. make a third possible? Like, what kind of like what kind of real business does this have to do? Or is it more about the popularity? Like, what, what people have to matter? enjoy it. People yeah. have to love it again. Yeah. I mean, people have to. I think they will because yeah, it is will. Birdemic. I mean, yeah, you've yeah. seen it if you like Birdemic. Yeah. But also, I want to get to a bigger audience because uh, one of my uh, the DP uh, Bobby said this to me actually after I showed him a very early rough cut and who's been with James for a long time. He said, Birdemic two, I think is the movie that a lot of people who checked out Birdemic wished it was right. Mm -hmm. And I go, that's great because you really don't need to, to, to see the first one to get this. Although I love the first one and I highly recommend it. You know, I had nothing to do with it except I'm just a huge fan. Um, But what I find interesting about James is he didn't really uh, he doesn't necessarily want to concentrate call it not know how to extend a romantic relationship what happens after the falling in love so he does repeat that right obviously uh, with new people so you know but I knew people wanted to see Alan and Whitney you know uh, Rod and Natalie so I said James you got a date how about a double date? You know, and it worked. He he made it all work. He right. actually did this, and um, and um, uh, can I say there's boobs in this one? Sure. All yeah. right, there's oh, there boobs in this one. I'm revealing. And, there, and there's a the, in a horror scene, no less. There's kind of a there is a straightish, yes, uh, almost referential horror. Yeah, scene. well, because it's Hollywood. Yeah, it's Hollywood. There horror. is a bit of the end of Pee Wee's Big Big Adventure where he goes from set to set, 
and the birds attack. But that's in the the last that's right. the latter half. I mean, does James have any interest in the horror at all, or was it just purely the ecology message he tried no. to get across? No, no, not at all. <laughs> just, no, it was it was actually my suggestion that uh-huh. let's not just have this at Universal because you know. Uh, so how about different sets and different movie right, sets? Yeah. And we'll save that surprise for people. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Fun. It's it's fun. Fun. Sets. So, but it's all, all pure James. I, I I just I just pushed him in certain directions and he went for it. But no, he's not a horror guy at all. He, his favorite, I mean, he loved Lincoln. He said he didn't quite understand it, but he loved it. You know, like for example, he went to the Rift Tracks event, which was October 25th of last year. Mm-hmm. Two days before, and uh, he told me he snuck into a theater in San Jose and uh, loved seeing people laughing and enjoying it, but didn't understand a single joke they made. Yeah. Wow. Which is kind of cool. So, yeah, we got we got a very unique guy. And I don't know any movies where really people take somebody of that ilk and let them drive a bigger bus on purpose. Right. It's almost impossible to find anybody who you know, that a lot of people doesn't get think it. you're crazy for doing that, and especially people giving you trying to get money. I mean, how, that can't be the easiest thing to raise money for saying you're going to let some guy drive a bus into well, a cliff. <laughs> well, I got I got married in July, so my uh-huh. you know you know very uh, upscale, elegant sort of South Africans, uh-huh. not sort of they're from South Africa, uh-huh. so they thought I was fucking nuts, completely. Right, like, right. what are you doing? Now they love it because yeah, yeah. they see it everywhere. What you are know? you doing, Jeffrey? Jim yeah, exactly. You're fucking nuts, man. You're fucking nuts, man. Yeah. Fucking nuts, mate. Fucking nuts mate. Stack, man. <laughs> but um, you know, they they became really supportive and everything. And it was my wife who's you know mostly the one who said you got to do this. So I credit Ashley, my wife, huh. nice. mostly for for this actually happening. Um, so raising the money, you know what? I'm lucky enough. I've been around now in movies for a while, and I know some people. And I went to a couple of investors. And basically went like this. Okay. And I was making the money for some other thing completely unrelated. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I need you to write a check for a couple hundred grand. Uh, You don't get your girlfriends in the movie. Oh, should I say girlfriend? I mean, your wives in the movie. Uh Uh, You don't get, you know, you don't get any say. You don't get to come to set. And uh, we have no distribution. And, um, but trust me, this is worth making. And basically they were like, oh man, really? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Nice. So they wrote me a check for, and, and, and I made the movie and I delivered it. Now they're very, very happy, especially since it's, it's coming to New York and they, I've told them where it's going to be and everything and that there's going to be a big right. red carpet and everything. So they're going to go. And they're like, oh, shit, yeah. So they'll see it with an audience that'll be screaming and things and very right. enthusiastic. So in terms, uh, you know, if, for film students out there, the advice that I can give is don't make a movie to make a movie. Make a movie that you truly, truly believe there is an audience for. I'm not saying it has to be a big audience, but make sure it's worth making. Okay, don't make just another blank. Right. You know, don't do it. Don't do it. The, the The market is too crowded, and don't make a bad movie. Don't try to make a bad movie. Um, you know, you don't make a bad movie and then put bird feathers all over your van and drive around Sundance right. every day in the cold yeah. because you think you made a shit movie. Exactly. No, yeah. he. You know, he, he, he did that because he believed. No, he's so proud of Birdemic, yeah, and he he, he just wanted great. to fix the production mistakes from Birdemic and make Birdemic two bigger and better and they're and all more fixed of, and more i've seen the romantic. film they're all fixed he didn't make any mistakes <laughs> in the film this is a flawless what's great is what's great is every time he said nope that's from the first one we're not going to be doing that again um it opened up about 10 brand new cinematic mistakes and the fact that it takes place in hollywood like people who know filmmaking should really really yeah. embrace this picture i, I oh, yeah. that's yeah that's kind of what the first 30 minutes is about really is hollywood stuff and i thought that yeah. was probably some of the funniest stuff i've seen you in you a long used, time you, i was kind of thank you I, first, I appreciate that and yeah. you actually use the word <laughs> with an m but i need you to say it i'm not going to lead Wait, you which one the first half of the movie is oh magic magic a masterpiece <laughs> a masterpiece <laughs> no it, well a ma- yeah a masterpiece of a magical masterpiece of, of, of masturbation ungrammat film gr- grammar <laughs> yes <laughs> you know what i mean it was wonderful it, it was really wonderful. Was. i mean every moment there's just something that happens yeah. where you're just off skewed to the side and yeah. there's something about that that feels in, in a way it also feels fresh because filmmaking after 100 years 
Yeah. And people have pretty much perfected it in, yeah. as a language, as a, what all of us get well, when look, we see it. You know, you know, I saw Argo. Right. You know, I don't know if you heard of this little independent film yeah. called Argo. A little bit. But, um, you know, I was, I was watching it. I was talking to, talking to a film nerd friend of mine. Uh-huh. He's actually a manager of Playboy, but in real life, he's just a total nerd. But, um, uh, you know, and, and, and we were discussing how Argo really was just very, especially the last half, was just the same beats as of an average slasher flick. I actually called uh, Oh, the Argo, key drops. Yeah, yeah. I called it cross-cutting the movie. Because that's oh, all, yeah, yeah. it's literally a whole movie that has nothing going except yeah. two stories and you're just cross-cutting no, to build tension. That's it. Yeah, There's, but, you know, yeah. spoiler for Argo, just like, I thought that last shot was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. You know, just, it, and, it, it and was. not true, I'm sure. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Right. Did you see Argo? Well, it doesn't no, matter if it's true know. or not. But, you know, it had the same beats of a slash. Movie. Oh, we dropped the key. Uh-oh. Oh, the phone's dead. Oh, he's walking to the thing. You know, and it's just like they've already perfected that. So right. it was a bit by the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Birdemic, Birdemic 2, The Resurrection, there are no numbers. It's just complete. I, I think I turned to the person next to me and said, this is one of the movies, even though you've seen some of the beats before in the first one, you, you do not know what's about to happen. No. Ever. Ever. <laughs> There's no way to get on top of a story where the next scene could just be someone driving a car, the next scene could be anything, and you're like, what? His choices yeah. are absolutely brilliant. You and that's know, fine. You know, that's he, he, of- he would, in cer- certain ways, as you know, leave the camera sitting there, wide shot, as if it's a Woody Allen picture, but it's a bird attack. And yet when there's a romantic scene and they're just having dinner, suddenly it turns into a Michael Bay movie and he's using (laughs) Dolly all over. You know this, right? right? right. And it's just like, what the hell is that choice? But it's his choice, so I love it. And so I think people are in for a good time. I think people should check it out. Go check out where it's playing. Yeah, well, the main thing is to go to the Birdemic, the Resurrection. No, this is Birdemic site. Yeah, to keep this is Birdemic. Because it's going to pop up in all sorts of places for bird. a while. Exactly. Before it plays any long stretch somewhere. We are heading to Portland. We're heading to San Francisco, obviously, right. uh, personally. But the film will be playing in other places. Yeah, uh, and like if you're in L.A. and you've missed a the, Cine family, I'm sure it's going to come it's gonna, back. Yeah, so. they, they emailed like, wow, it actually sold out. So we're rethinking. Yeah. we got to release this a couple yeah. times. But we'll awesome. be on the road. And we have a London premiere. That's going to be massive. See it uh, drunk. That's the that's the best. See it drunk. See it drunk. <laughs> see it drunk. Yeah. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know what I could put on the post. See it drunk's good. See I was kind of, you good. know, but because, you know, that Dazed and Confused took the, you know, that, that great see it with a bud oh, yeah. line. Yeah. But um, it was very, very important, you know, even on the marketing for this, for the poster, I was not going to be, who will survive? Question mark, question right, mark. Right. Like, no, no, you know. So the tagline ultimately is um, Hollywood is about to take a beating. Which it obviously has a double meaning. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> so um, I love the flick. I think people will really embrace it. I hope they yeah. do. I hope they enjoy it. That we made no, I mean, for the look, fans. We both started and so we both you, are here to dispel the myth that a lot of people are worried, oh, this is going to yeah. be referential. It's not. It's not This at film all. was made with the same heart. And if you like the first one, this one's you're probably going to like it. I think, uh, yeah, I think you're going to like it. I think, it's, I think it's, uh, just, it's faster paced, but, equal, yeah. but oddly paced at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because he, you're, he's making the movie. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm that's yeah. the point, right? It's yeah, like, you know, and I, I, we're in the middle of doing subtitles for France because we're gonna, we got a premiere at the uh, in France uh-huh. uh, in May, um, and I was almost like I don't know how to even get this translated, so I had to send the movie to somebody just so they could see what was going on because it's like if you read, you know, get the fuck out of here. Does that mean that it's not in the line in the movie? Right. He doesn't like cursing, but you know, get the fuck out of here, or is it? You know, get the fuck out of here, or is it get the fuck out of here? You know, right, so right. I was like, ah, oh, I really need him to see this because the magic isn't just in the words; it's how <laughs> how it's said it's and what it is. So yeah. we're doing subtitles yeah, that's right the phrasing, now. In that's going to be hard because one of the things that makes it so yeah. funny is that the phrasing is just slightly off the grammar. Yes, like the actual language grammar is just yeah. slightly askew. You know what I wanted to do, and 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 they said <laughs> no. Uh, but I actually wanted to have it translated into French phonetically and just bring the cast back and have him do that. That was a weird, weird idea I hmm. had, you know? So like parlez-vous France, you That's know, what they used to hearing do Rod. Films. Huh. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, to hear Rod, to hear Alan try to stumble through French. Oh, yeah, that would been, no, that probably would be a good way to do it. But uh, ultimately we're just doing subtitles per the theater chain's request. Um, but, uh, All right, you hear that, people in France? People in France. <laughs> Make sure you get All your tickets. All of our tickets. French listeners. Uh, All our French listeners. There's hordes of them. We wish you the best of luck with yes. this tour, you. this world tour. Um, we also will work on trying to get Rob to come to in person 
yeah. to see, to it in see a film because I think that could be a fun experience. And if yeah. it's not, you're less likely to walk out after 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. Look, look, look. There's bad like Indiana Jones four, right? There's like when you know there's a guy yeah. phoning it in, and then there's when a guy's trying his best. And I will, you know it. Yeah. I will get you drunk beforehand, right? And, and that's it. I well, can't drink, so like you, you have to drink for like two hours <laughs> yeah. now. I do, we'll alcohol, do shots. And <laughs> it should be a good time. Um, go see it. I love it. See it with friends. Definitely, it's an event picture. So we're yeah. doing Q and A's all over the place. See you in New York. See you uh, in Boston, Philadelphia. We'll see you and and in Europe. Jeff's gonna be busy. <laughs> okay, we we don't have much time, so we're gonna rush yeah. through a couple of news headlines. Okay, and uh, you can. Would you Excellent. like me to leave? No, or? stay put. Stay put. Is it um, is it about Jewish eroticism? Let's see. We can I'll, see. I here. actually don't know where we're going. Um, so in Jewish eroticism news, yeah. um, if it's about Eli Roth, it is. Okay, maybe <laughs> Carrie the musical is coming to L.A. Oh no, I'm in. I can't wait to see. Really? it. Are you serious? Yeah, is this a real I love thing? horror musical stuff. Oh my gosh, I was kind of cringing. And you know, I I have to say, last week we had um, Roy from Keys, whose uh-huh. last name I can never pronounce. Street on. trash. I have been dreaming of writing Street Trash the musical for so long. Oh, really? mm-hmm. Dave's going to kill me because he kept saying, like, let's copyright it. Let's copyright it. So it's it's copywritten already. But, okay. um, yeah. yeah I'm sure that. you could ask him. <laughs> I, I'd rather see Swirly the musical. but I, Oh, my <laughs> gosh, yeah. So um, Carrie the musical is coming to L.A. I'm anxious to see how it is and if it spreads around. Did anybody see um, The Silence of the Lambs the musical? I did. It was great. Are you serious? Oh God, I, maybe so... I got to start seeing these things. I, c- I couldn't believe how funny it was. I mean, because it, I mean, Silence of the Lambs is just a that's laugh the, riot. That's the thing. It's like, it's, it's such inappropriate humor. You know, I, there's a whole song called I Can Smell Her Cunt. Wow. Which is when she shows up for the first time. And that's I guess we can Lecter. swear on here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. No one ever, no no one ever takes that opportunity. And I was gonna, I'm using it nonstop yeah. now. And I was going to play it to the in-laws yeah. this weekend to show them how important I was. I I'm know. on radio. Just take an excerpt. Tell them yeah. I said the C word. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's but no, it is. It's really, really funny. I, I thought it was pretty great. There's, there's. Oh, yeah. Haven't you seen that like Lego... Um, they recreated one of the songs with Legos, and it's like a famous YouTube video, but it's from Silence, the musical. I have not seen yeah. this. It's called Put the Put the Fucking Lotion in the Basket. Oh, hell awesome. yeah. I'm okay. singing back and forth. I'll send that clip to you guys later. You guys should look it up on YouTube, but yeah, it's hilarious. So Evil Dead, the musical is great. Musical guy. I did like Reanimator, the musical. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic. I'm not a musical guy either, but yeah. if it's like a horror movie that, right. that does it, then... Reanimator was hilarious. They're a great performance. Yeah. That mm-hmm. was the thing. They really... And, and had all the original creators involved yeah so yeah. gordon's yeah. directing a musical of his own thing sure i'm in you know right right and that was the great thing I, I do remember asking jeffrey combs about it like right after he'd been to the premiere and i remember saying and he's just like mm, eh, didn't really <laughs> <laughs> i remember going Ooh. it's okay <laughs> yeah i thought yeah. that was like but been... one of my interns went every single show yeah no i remember yeah, she was That's there badness. every yeah. show she was like their groupie and for she reanimator knew for reanimator and by the end of it, like, and it was her birthday and she was like, Fango people come join me for reanimator. So we all went and like, it was her birthday party at the reanimator and the cast like all knew her because she went every show. I, I got to tell you, I, I, I love the show as it was when they actually premiered it, but I saw it, um, maybe like six months before they started, they did a, like a special reading just to test it out on stage mm-hmm. and a friend of mine worked with Stewart. So I got to go see it that way. And the cast he had was like so goddamn amazing. I think George Went was the only person that stayed, mm-hmm. but it was like um, the guy that played the father mm-hmm. was um, he's the guy that played like Dick Thornburg in the Die Hard movies, like oh my gosh. one and two. And he was like amazing, funny, and sleazy all in one. And then like the security guy was the guy that played like Hollywood from Mannequin, like all these. Like, oh my gosh, he's still much- acting. Yeah. I want to cast him in something. That's He's amazing. Cool. He's also the father in Class Act, which is one of my favorite kid and play movies. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is the least horror episode we'll ever do. It's like, is there, a, Lebo- is there a Lebowski? Uh, Thong? Is there a Lebowski? Musical? Musical? Not yet, but it's inevitable. I'm sure. Because yeah. Lebowski Thong's huge. I'm going to start writing it just as a quick, Just as a, a quick aside, my sister, when I was, she's younger than me, but she was on Broadway for years with Kathleen Turner in a show, Cat on Hot and Roof, speaking of Tennessee right. Williams. Um, you know, in the 80s, just before Giuliani took over. So it was like, I got to live in New York. Oh, that the was the New cool York. years Oh my God. Well, look, look, we were at the <laughs> Eugene O'Neill Theater. She was at the Eugene O'Neill wow, Theater. the Fango and office was, is actually right, it's in the same building as the Eugene O'Neill. Really? We just use a different door. Yeah, because whenever our internet goes out, I pill for internet off the Eugene O'Neill Theater. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Not we, anymore, so you don't. We didn't have internet back then. <laughs> we just had lots and lots of hookers. So, uh, but right around the corner from the Eugene O'Neill Theater, and this is a, t- this is a time that's gone now in New York, and I'm taking over the conversation again, but uh, 
uh, right around the corner. I remember as a kid, I remember looking in the corner and and seeing uh, the dirty movie houses, and it was Breaststrokes 3. I just nice. remember seeing that. They're over on 9th Avenue now. Instead of 8th, they've moved uh, one block so. over. Yeah. So. But it was pre-Julian. There, there's literally, when I turned like 15, you know, in New York, it was different. So they allowed me in a strip club. And there's literally, it was Runway 69. And now my in-laws definitely aren't going to hear this. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's literally an Applebee's where my strip club used to be. And I, I think know that, where that strip club was. Then. That's like, yeah, exactly. So that's a very sad. That's a really good Applebee's. <laughs> I mean, it's really it's not, saucy, though. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's still a strip club right across from that Applebee's. Lace is still right across from okay. that Applebee's. But who can afford to go to Lace? I mean, Well, that like wasn't pricey. my place. You know. right, we got to wrap the news. Yes, we're completely. almost done. We're, we're, um, <laughs> the only other our two-hour two things. show. Sorry, um, no, I've <laughs> also got Aftershock is now going to theaters in May. Has anybody else seen it? Is that the Eli Roth Chile? Yeah, 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 it's the one in Chile. It's about um, the earthquake where prison yes. breaks open and all these prisoners come out and this guy trying to kind of fight his way through. It's a sequel to Spring Breakers. <laughs> Pretty much, James so, Franco yeah. and Selena Gomez because she's on this too, right? Selena Gomez. Oh yeah, she's yeah. she's one of the prisoners. I haven't seen it yet, but I I hear not very good things. I was not fond of it, but that could just be me. Okay. I, I I was not. It was very kind of punchy and rapey, and that's about all. I yeah, got. I heard there's a very inappropriate, <laughs> out of nowhere rape scene in the middle Completely. of that, and that's what bothers people a lot about. Yeah, it, it no, was seriously. And I mean, I, I, it's not like you know I'm pro rape scene or anything like that. But I, they, if but they serve totally, a purpose, I'm not laughing yeah. at this. I, I need to share this because sometimes you <laughs> see something that is just so funny. And I'm looking over at Becca's notes. I see the two words next to Eli Roth's name, rapey and boring. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone who makes a note that says rapey and boring is already, that's, that should that's be on the poster. But you know, I actually, I had a question. <laughs> rapey, she wrote rapey. How spell rapey? <laughs> she like, wrote do rapey. you drop the E? Or is it, because that technically the, uh, would make it an adverb. And, you know, I, no, the, the, the E has to stay nerd. for it to be, to, for the full effect of rape. So rapey is not. Says, it says <laughs> rapey it's, and boring. Rapey for the and record, boring. for the record, I have officially <laughs> stepped out of this conversation. <laughs> They do not represent Redemic <laughs> to the Resurrection. But yeah. So rappy and boring yeah, right. describes oh, okay. the movie for me. Um, Zombieland, the TV show, they released a teaser this week. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't, kinda, I haven't seen it either, it. but everybody's telling me that it's absolutely amazing. I have to go home and like actually spend some time on the internet hunting it down. But cool. um, everybody's saying it's amazing. But I'm not so sure that the TV show is going to do well. Huh. Yeah, Depends what know. zombies what? people want right now. Yeah, I, mean. I, think yeah, we're, I think we're a little over zombied, but that could just be me. Is is that in like an Amazon exclusive thing they're doing? I can't remember who's doing it. I'm not too sure where it. it's going. I thought it was like Amazon. It didn't get as detailed notes as Rappy and Boring. So. Right. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So um, we'll have to keep posted on that. And then the last one, um, they're casting for Insidious too right now, and they just cast um, Lindsay seemed to play a uh, young um, Lin Chi. Well, they oh. they wrapped. I think that that was like a casting note. Oh, I'm so behind on everything then. No, like I think that was somebody that they were keeping a secret. I think. Oh. Okay, I was going to say because they, they just, they just started that this shooting, week. but I don't. I'm no, no, it's, it's been like the month. You know? Oh, really? They definitely okay. wrapped already. Wow. But yeah, it'll yeah. it'll be in theaters. It's kind of later a prequel, this. though. It, it's like Lin Shay's life before she gets to the, well, the insidious one. Yeah, you know who's cool is uh, uh, Jocelyn Donahue from oh, House of Devil actress. plays uh, Barbara Hershey Young oh, oh, that's so in cool. Insidious 2. Yeah. Oh, very Because I wanted her cast oh, yeah, in Suspiria. they knew each other. Yeah, me too. I yeah, was really like, I was like, if you're going to do Suspiria, a remake, just cast Jocelyn. Yeah, yeah she would have mm. been perfect. She would have been great. But yeah, but she's going to be young Barbara that's great. Hershey. Oh, I'm I think much cool. more excited about it. Barbara Hershey, when she was young, was the hottest woman mm-hmm. on earth. When she was like, Beaches years. Yeah. Eighteen. Yeah. <laughs> There's a film last summer. <laughs> Something about the eighties and the women. Uh, yeah. 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 Pick up a Playboy magazine. It's just uh, so uh, it's a magical time. And then the nineties <laughs> came and we all quit shaving our pits. Exactly. And our hair long and all And speaking of not shaving. Like There's a happy medium, you know. <laughs> ladies. There's a happy medium. Well, next time you hear us on air, Becca will probably have a child. One of us will have a hit sequel to a Woo! movie. Uh, and Is it the, me? Uh, and then me and Rob will be back. <laughs> 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 now that you've said that she's going to be born in the next week, you've totally I have. It. I've jinxed this. So well, this. I was really hoping for yesterday because I thought it'd be cool to have her birthday. Or I'm sorry, today, because I was hoping that it would be 3 13, 13. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's an awesome birthday. But if she's born tomorrow, it's Pi Day, 3 14. The fifteenth oh. is the Ides of March, and the seventeenth is St. Patty's Day. So I've got a couple of options oh, yeah. in there. And you've got red ha- hair, and if you have a red-headed kid on St. Patty's Day, they're done yeah. for. 
Yeah. Elric and, I, Elric and I can bear hug you hard if you really yeah, yeah, need you a want date. to squeeze this guy. You know, I keep I keep reading all of these little like blogs on things that will send you into labor naturally. And so like today or last night I read yes. that dates did it. So today I bought all these dates and I've been eating dates all day and I'm so fucking sick of dates and I'm still not in labor. Are so. you sure they mean dates the fruit? Because if if, if, if you have dates. if you have a date like a plan to do something, <laughs> that's when it'll happen. Okay, I gotta work on that. I always so. found dates to be too rapey and boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you. You know, they after taste it's very rapey and boring. And that is where we will end let's, on let's, uh, rapey that, and boring dates. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. All the best. And, uh, you know, the, we, this will be our horror light episode. Next week, we are going to be talking to some, I believe, can I say yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Brian, uh, Brian Collins is coming in, uh, who does a site called Horror Movie a Day. And he also writes for Badass Digest. He was a bloody disgusting for a while. And how many years has he done? Uh, since, so since 2007, he has yeah. watched a horror movie every single day. And he is retiring at 2,500. That's so. incredible. We're going to talk to him. Uh, he's like an encyclopedia, and I love that down. man. So. And so we'll, so we, yeah, we'll, you know, it'd be nice to get in some questions before the show for him. Yeah, so, you know about his best, worst, all the all the things. In oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, join us next week, same time, whenever that is. And, same bat channel. Yeah, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. See you at the movies. Thanks.